So a couple of months ago, I was asked to speak at the um, TypeCon conference. Now, yeah, that, that really does exist. There really is a TypeCon. Um, and if you think graphic designers are uptight and anal people, go to TypeCon. <laughs> 45 minutes on italics. It was, <laughs> it was thrilling. Um, but they asked me, they, they said, would you please talk about the typography of Disneyland? And, and at first, I, I, I thought, that is the dumbest idea I've ever heard in my life. What am I going to do? Show a slide and be like, that's a W. Uh, that, there's an A. I, you know, it seemed, it seemed sort of silly. But then the more that I looked into this, the more I realized I was sort of feeling like I was in familiar territory and that I was finding information that seemed to have a lot to do with, with the philosophy that we've worked with as a company for the last 17 years with our clients um, that had to do with optimism and reassurance. So that's what I'm here to talk about today, is optimism and reassurance. Here's the connection. This is my business partner, Noreen Morioka, and myself in 1993. We decided to form Adams Morioka in 1993 on the people mover in Tomorrowland at Disneyland. Yes, it was fortuitous, and that sounds like a myth, but it's not. Um, this, of course, was in the time of another recession, and it was very fashionable at the time, if you were a designer, to do work that was very dystopian, and the cult of the ugly was very, very cool. Now, if you look at me, you realize that's quite impossible for me to reach. So I'm not going to be cool. I might as well not try. And we really did believe that design could make the world a better place. Um, we strongly were, were interested in the ideas of, of utopianism and not dystopia. We wanted to create messages that actually had to do with optimism. Today, in the midst of another recession, or wait, are we we're out of the recession? Is that the case? Or into another recession? Somewhere in, in the R word world, um, and while we're working with any client, we think optimism in the communication is more critical than ever. And going to the TypeCon lecture, I actually found that Disneyland connection to be something that embodied this idea of optimism and reassurance in a very, very physical way. So you may be saying, Disneyland, really? Yes, really. Um, but let me back up a bit, and maybe I can help explain some of this to you guys. It's the early 1950s, and Walt Disney it takes his, his two daughters to these um, kind of horrible parks in Los Angeles that you can still go to that are kind of carny atmosphere, disgusting, scary places. And he, he wonders, well, I wish there were a place where I could take my kids and I could enjoy myself too. So the idea of Disneyland is born. He buys a bunch of orange groves down in Anaheim, California, right next to where the I-5 freeway is just about to be constructed. One year later, July 17th, 1955, Disneyland opens. The first day is a complete and horrible disaster. It's, it's like bad, bad, bad. Um, someone had forged 10,000 extra tickets, so the park's overflowing. Um, it was 110 degrees in the shade, so women's shoes were melting in the asphalt. The attractions broke down, the water fountains broke down. Everybody, I think to this day, they call it Black Sunday. Um, Within a year, though, Disneyland was a, uh, was a big success. Um, today, Disneyland is the number two tourist attraction in the world. Number one is Walt Disney World. Um, there are estimated to be over a million annual passport holders. I'm one of them. Um, so why? Now, on the surface, this all makes sense, right? Yeah, it's a fun place to go, whatever. Um, but in order to understand this enormous success and the enormous connection that the public has to this place, we need to look at America post-war. After two decades of depression and world war, America emerges as an industrial giant. And it's a great time. There's enormous feelings of abundance. Everybody feels like, wow, things are great. We are the leaders, and we're moving forward, and there's a world of new ideas, and boy, this is, gonna, this is fantastic. Now, schizophrenically, at the exact same time, people are terrified of atomic warfare. They're feeling isolated in the suburban, suburban car culture. And they have this general sense of dissatisfaction and social competition. So how do you deal with that? Disneyland presented a place where you could enjoy the past, and not the past of the Dust Bowl or the Depression or Iwo Jima, but an earlier, more optimistic time. And it also presented a place where the future was safe and everything had worked out just fine. The important thing about the design of Disneyland is that it was actually designed not by architects that had actually been tried at the beginning and it failed, but by animators. 
They knew how to tell a story, and that was their priority when designing the park. People can live without food and water for a certain amount of time. We cannot live without telling stories for any amount of time.、Um, that's the way our brains are, are wired. We cognitively create narrative all the time. So, for example, you see a woman in a funny hat. Now, you don't just see the hat and the woman and just say "hat woman." You actually make up a story in your head. It may be split second, and you're like, "Well, she's a socialite. She just came from a, a big hat party, or、oh, she loves big hats and likes walking around fish sculptures. Whatever it is, you've made up some quick story." Now, Disneyland takes takes advantage of the way that we make sense of the world by telling stories. And you need to think of it not as a collection of attractions, but as a cinematic experience. The idea of storytelling takes the guest out of their daily life and puts them into a completely different reality.、Um, in a sense, it makes the guest the actor in their own movie. Once through the Main Street gates, the Main Street Railroad Station serves as a title sequence to the experience. We get the film's name and sense of the plot. It's clearly. A story, an American story, with、um, a, sort of a ti- another time. Everyone then passes under the t- through the tunnel under the train train tracks, and as if the lights have dimmed, and then you emerge onto Main Street. It's a cinematic experience. Main Street is based on Walt Disney's hometown of Marceline, Missouri. This is、um, Marceline, Missouri, around 1900. If accuracy had been the goal, this is what Main Street would look like: muddy streets, manure,、uh, bare telephone poles. Really, don't make for a particularly enchanting Sunday afternoon. So, Main Street is a symbolic representation of what we all believe an American small town Main Street should be. It's it's the one we see in our heads under the category America, Midwest, small town, 1900. The buildings are iconic representations of actual reality. Optimism and hope are apparent through the enormous amount of lavish detail that is put on all elements, from the structures to the design to the typography. The function of each space is defined in iconic form. A cinema looks like a cinema, like in a cartoon.、Um, we're not overwhelmed with decisions about what is that. I don't understand what that is. And decisions create anxiety. So that sets that whole part aside for us. The design of Disneyland is not really reality; it's hyperreality.、Um, Main Street, in reality, if, if you, you know, I'm assuming many people have been there, but if not, you know, you'll get the sense of it.、Um, Main Street's really a strip mall. It's a strip mall with false facades. But in the outside world, stores and strip malls all compete with each other. The signs compete with each other. The buildings compete with each other. Everyone's sort of jostling for more attention. On Main Street, all of the elements have been worked together in harmony. Each building is based on a common set of proportions. The main street's not threatening. It's meant to be a pleasant experience. It's not meant to be some raucous, overjoyed, oh my god, I'm losing my mind, having a wonderful time experience, but a nice time. The aesthetic may be a mix of multiple typefaces, colors, and shapes, but they really work harmoniously by maintaining unifying color palette and placement. If they had all been one typeface, say Helvetica, it has an authoritarian, authoritarian tone that they don't want. The, the unifying form and order comes through diversity, not sameness. For example, a horizontal band of typography at each level of the building helps us identify the type of message that we are being given. The building's purpose or the name is identified right above street level. On the third story, fictional businesses are painted on each of the windows. At the pedestrian level, signs, messages, and objects are placed in the windows of the stores. This messaging doesn't help us actually find anything. It doesn't provide us any actual real information. It simply expands on the idea of individual stories and different characters. It's sort of a deeper look into the life of this small town. Additional messages are set at an even more detailed level.、Um, in this instance, a grate on the street. And if the street signs are a medium shot, these are the close-ups. And it's these small moments that are scattered throughout Disneyland that make the viewer feel they have found one special detail that no one else has ever seen, and that makes them feel connected and intimate with the place. If Main Street were a quiet Midwestern town, it might be comforting, but it would probably be dull, just boring. So, 
to solve that problem and emphasize the idea of optimism, Main Street is set at a time when energy and activity are constant, when inventions were changing America. Um, the buildings and the smells, the, the sights of the street, all point to a time of great change in optimism. Electrical lamps are replacing the old gas lamps. The, um, the horseless carriage is passing the horse-drawn trolley. Um, there's new telephones in the market house. This is what's giving it the sense of excitement, that it's always in motion, and it's, it's, a, it's an, an incredibly re re rich time to be alive. This is the interior of a store at the beginning of the 20th century. Now, the reality is cluttered, messy, and probably fairly dangerous. The market house on Main Street reinvents this idea, and it actually provides us with iconic elements that are part of a narrative. And it's not simply one story like Pollyanna. Um, there's sub-stories running throughout the place. For example, the corn dog cart reinforces the idea that there's a local baseball team that somehow is selling corn dogs. From the beginning, Disneyland passionately advocated public transportation. It strongly disavowed the idea of the suburban Los Angeles car culture. Um, the automobile has been banned, and in its place, the omnibus, the horse-drawn trolley, and the Disneyland Railroad are taking its place. But the public transportation in this instance is dressed up as part of a story. Reassurance, second part of this. So let's revisit the post-war feelings of freedom, abundance, liberation from old ideas mixed with um, anxiety about atomic war, social competition, and dissatisfaction. Tomorrowland in the 1950s allowed for a safe idea of the future, one that didn't have nuclear bomb shelters, cultural unrest, and urban blight. As a whole, of course, Disneyland is about reassurance. Every decision has been made to provide the sense, the guest, a sense that everything is good. Don't worry. Do not have anxiety. It is built to provide a sense of pleasure and joy. Tomorrowland was a world where the American corporation was all good and working for a better utopian culture. Corporate identity was king in Tomorrowland. And Tomorrowland was a world on the go. It was a modernist future, and it wasn't a sterile, cold Bauhaus future. It was bright with softer forms, a much friendlier modernism. And some of the park's best attractions were actually built at this time, um, like the People Mover. I shouldn't tell you this, but I think I'm responsible for the closing of the People Mover. Um, when Noreen and I would ride it for, for many years, we sat up there and just shouted down at guests, no matching outfits, no matching outfits. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's why they closed it. This is the Monsanto House of the Future, and it, it, it boasted the entire house was built of plastic. When it was demolished, the wrecking ball bounced off of it. It had to be taken <laughs> apart piece by piece. Every item in the, the house was synthetic, and the narration actually says, there is not a single natural material in this house. <laughs> <laughs> now, keep in mind the time that this is all happening. It's 1967. There's cultural unrest. We're in the middle of a Cold War. We're fighting the Vietnam War. There's enormous generational splits. Um, but at the, at the same time, there's this clear sense of optimism and a belief of progress towards a better life. Um, at tomorrow, in Tomorrowland, we were reassured that everything would turn out fine, and not just fine, but really fine, really good. And even dangerous ideas like, counterculture ideas like um, anti-establishment were filtered through this non-threatening and optimistic lens. Psychedelia, in this instance, was not about acid and drug use. It's about a mod and bright optimism. I, I love that group. They're so hokey, sadly nerdy people. <laughs> and then there's It's a Small World. It was introduced at the 1964 World's Fair and transported to Disneyland. Now, some of you are probably saying, no, no, God, no, please, not the devil dolls. <laughs> but don't worry. There's no music, no singing. I won't force you to sing It's a Small World. It's a Small World, in my opinion, is genius. I think it is a remarkable structure. Mary Blair was the primary designer, and she, was, she wasn't an architect, she was an illustrator. She designed with gouache, cut paper, egg cartons, and craft items. And the attraction was built basically based on her kind of crafty models, just made giant. So the result is this masterpiece of flat forms and iconic shapes. The optimism and exuberance is a result of the simple graphic forms and the handmade quality. They do appear to be built as if a from a child's box of craft items, from scissors and cardboard and glue and um, some cardboard boxes. 
this quality of being created in the same way that we might make a macaroni frame in preschool gives us cues to the storyline and a clear icono iconographic message as to what the content is. Now, integral to, this, to the belief in optimism is the idea of victory. We must always have that idea that we will win for this to work. At the end of Soarin' Over California, which is a new attraction at Disney's California Adventure, the audience flies over Sleeping Beauty Castle at night just as the fireworks begin to explode. It's in the same way that the wonderful world of Disney used to end with the fireworks in the background. Every audience claps and cheers at this point. Now, I thought this was because the audience was primarily made up of Californians, and we all have a sense of ownership and a sense of pride in Disneyland. But the same thing happened when I went to Florida. It's the wealth of detail, attention to quality, connection to the narrative, and a sense of reassurance that is engendering this loyalty and connection. And most importantly, it's the overriding concept of optimism. It seems lately that we've been told that we need to learn to live with less and that the world moving forward is going to be a place where, because of our past excesses, it will be impossible to dream and make dreams come true. We need to become hardcore pragmatists. But that's contrary to the human spirit. Whatever our differences are, regardless of our, of our politics, culture, race, or social status, we all deeply believe in the idea of optimism and progress. Thank you. Thank you, John.